some casual takes with your boy Stephen Pepper. Here to get some takes off my chest. <sighs> Here on this Monday, got a couple NBA playoff games to talk about. And you know what I got to talk about first. I got to talk about the Lakers. Particularly one guy. You know, I begged and begged Rob Polinka to trade D'Angelo Russell. Because I knew you can't trust him in a big environment. And just when I started to believe in him, he sells in Denver again. I don't know if he understands, but he is the third best player on this team. If he isn't impactful, the Lakers have the same odds of winning the series as I do marrying a Kardashian. And let me tell you, buddy, it's zero. I'm not even asking him to box with point for point for Jamal Murray. I'm just asking you to be playable. Don't get cooked on off-ball defense and just hit a few timely threes. And he can't even do that. Here's your ball game right here. Here's your Lakers ball game right here. This sequence. Middle of the third quarter, the Lakers are still in somewhat of a control. Three-point game. They're in transition. D'Angelo Russell, horrible turnover. It was so bad, LeBron is screaming at him. They go down the Nuggets and score. Thankfully, Anthony Davis was on one on Saturday and put us back up three. And then we get a rare stop. So I'm thinking, here come the Lakers. Braun, beautiful pass to find a cutting D-low. And he smokes the layup that would have put us up five. Momentum gone. They go down and hit a three. The Lakers don't see a lead for the rest of the game. It was so obvious that that sequence just killed any momentum the Lakers had in that game, even Irvin Magic Johnson, the great himself, tweeted that sequence and blamed it on D'Angelo Russell. Like, are you serious, bro? That's the ball game right there. That transition. Ball game. And even another sequence, down seven. The Lakers, you know, trying to make another fake comeback against the Denver Nuggets. Four minutes left. Seven point deficit, four minutes. That's not bad when you have a good shooting offense. Kind of a last chance at a comeback here. D'Angelo Russell was coming off a screen, foul baiting. Are you serious? He misses the three. MPJ goes down the floor on the other end and hits a three. Nuggets go up 10. Ball game. Over with. Raps. See in game two. Foul baiting. When we need to win this ball game. The reality for the Lakers is this. They need to be flawless to beat Denver. Denver is one of the best teams I've ever seen in my life. They're just a well-oiled machine. That Jokic-Murray two-man game, it never stops. You have to be perfect from tip to the final buzzer to beat this Nuggets team. And you can't have bad stretches. Like, you can't have a D'Angelo Russell going one for nine from three. And I knew the game was cooked. Not when the Lakers were down 20. But when Bronny Anthony Davis had 37 combined points in the first half. And I looked at the scoreboard at halftime, and the Lakers were only up three. They're only up three, by the way, because LeBron hit that logo three. I was scared. And then I looked at ESPN. D'Angelo Russell was 0 for 5 from 3 in the first half. LeBron and Anthony Davis even combined for more points at the end of the game than Jokic and Murray. If you were to tell me Saturday morning that LeBron James and Anthony Davis were to combine for more points than Jamal Murray and Nicole Jokic, I would be like, okay, the Lakers win my cool 5-6 steal game one pretty important. They lost by 11. What the hell happened? Well, because Denver's other guys showed up. When Austin Reeves, Rui Hachimura, and particularly D'Angelo Russell looked scared. didn't Well, D'Angelo Russell didn't look scared. He was just hitting bricks. 13 points, 6 for 20. That's 30% from the field. 1 for 9 from 3. I'm not asking D'Angelo Russell to be an all-star, to get to Jamal Murray's level. We have LeBron and Anthony Davis for that. I'm just asking you, can you be playable? KCP hit like four threes all in the third quarter because D'Angelo Russell kept falling asleep off ball, and then here comes KCP wide open for three. Can you just stick on a screen over KCP? Can you, when we're on a run, just hit one three? You're 40% on the season. Can you just go three for nine instead of one for nine? That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking you to be an all-star, and this is why I want him to be traded. Because no matter how fun he was in the regular season and helped the Lakers to win basketball games, I knew this was inevitable, that he would just stink again in Denver. And he has this, this is his last chance tonight. Because if the Lakers lose tonight, 
against the Nuggets game two, it's over. Because they'll be 10 in a row to the Denver Nuggets. It will never have a chance at beating them. But if D'Angelo Russell stinks it up again, he's going to find his ass on the bench just like last season. You you can't play D'Angelo Russell if he has one more bad game. That's a message of Darvin Ham. Man, I was so tight, bro. After Saturday, oh, dude, I was throwing stuff in my room. These flags you guys see behind me, they were coming down. My bed was a mess. My jersey was on the floor. My chair that I'm sitting in, I was getting, I was flipping it. Because D'Angelo Russell's going, you know, one for nine from three. And I got to have it game one momentum, momentum swinging game. But game two's tonight, D'Angelo Russell, you better not stink it up. Okay, let's talk about this last game. Um, you guys know I've been grinding during the playoffs. We're going to probably have a show tomorrow, given how – yeah, we're probably going to have a show tomorrow, and I'm going to come on and guarantee I'm talking with the Lakers tomorrow. Um, Clippers, uh, they beat the Mavericks. Game one, 109-97, to without Kawhi Leonard. And the star of the show was James Harden. James Harden, uh, 28 points, an efficient uh, – he had six threes out of 11, and he had eight assists. That game proved why the Harden trade was absolutely worth it. And I told you on the day of the trade – it was a good move for two reasons. Number one, Horton gives the Clippers their first real point guard in the Kawhi PG era. I mean, who ever since that duo formed, who's been their point guards? Patrick Beverly, Terrence Ann, Russell Westbrook, not on 30 minutes at night. Their first true run the offense, get guys in advantage situations, point guard, eight assists last night. They have a really good record when Harden has 10 plus assists. But number two, and this is most importantly, he raises the Clippers' floor to be a more competitive team in a playoff series when either PG or in or Kawhi inevitably miss games. It's inevitable. I know you can't you can't game plan in the NBA around one of your stars getting hurt, but it's kind of like the Sixers with Joel Embiid and the Clippers with Kawhi Leonard. Uh, you kind of have to factor in they're going to miss some playoff games, so you bring in a James Harden because this is the reality for the Clippers: is their duo has been healthy for just one full playoff run, and that was in the bubble. You know, when they blew that 3-1 lead to the Denver Nuggets. Had to blow, had to add that one in there. But since the Clippers have left the bubble, they played 24 playoff games, and their duo has been healthy for just 13 of them. Meaning, half of the Clippers' playoff games since the bubble, they've been without either Paul George or Kawhi Leonard. They missed the postseason in 2022 by losing two playing games because Kawhi Leonard was already out for the entire season due to injury, and Paul George so happened to go on health and safety. They had no one against the Pelicans, no one against the Timberwolves. Their best players were like Terrence Mann and Norman Powell. They were cooked. So you bring in a James Harden to create advantage situations for role players and be a reliable scorer on an increased volume in the postseason when you're shorthanded. And James Harden seems to agree so. He said after the game, quote, I can score with the best of them. Still can score with the best of them. My role player, my role for this team is just generating really good shots and making guys' jobs easier, okay? And then when my number to to score is called, God, my reading sucks, then you score the basketball. Obviously, Kawhi is out, so my playmaking and volume is going to go up and a little bit more and take advantage of it. Like, imagine that Phoenix Sun series where they were without Paul George for that entire series due to knee injury, yet another playoff series with your entire star out, and then Kawhi only played two games because of an injury of his own. Imagine if they had James Harden. They stole game one with Kawhi Leonard. They lost the other game with Kawhi Leonard. They probably wouldn't that with James Harden. Or how competitive that series goes to six or seven if Harden and Westbrook are pushing against Phoenix Suns last year. I can't tell you who's going to win this series against the Mavs or the Clippers. I picked Mavs before the series because – as much as I was high on the Clippers in January, from like February on, I thought the Mavs were just playing better basketball. And I just can't trust the Clippers' health in the postseason. And I do think the Mavs will play better in game two. They had a horrible, horrible worst-case scenario I've ever seen in a playoff series as far as half. I mean, they had eight points. Eight points in the second quarter. Harden and Russ, they combined for the same amount of points, 30 points in the first half as the Dallas Mavericks did, as a team. But what I can tell you is this, is that if there's no James Harden trade, and Kawhi Leonard is still hurt, and it's the same matchup against the Mavericks in Los Angeles, and Paul George has to go out there with Norman Powell, Russell Westbrook, and like Batum and a couple pieces from that Harden deal, the Clippers aren't winning. 
They're down 0-1 going into game two if there's no Harden trade. I know Batum had that crazy little game against the Miami Heat in the play-in. He had five points against the Knicks in game one. That's who PG's going to have to drag out there without James Harden. While the Mavs were having a bad first half, James Harden was the one cooking the offense and going for like 13 in the first quarter. And the big criticism, when I try to tell you guys this was going to happen in October, that when Kawhi or Paul George missed time in the playoffs, James Harden is going to be here to help. Everyone's like, oh, we'll just see in the playoffs. We know James Harden always stinks it up there. Now, say what you want about James Harden as a playoff performer. And he does have, and I have my criticism with him, he does drop in some series. But on a given night, James Harden can get you some spectacular playoff games. He has his lows, but he also has his highs. Remember last year? Boston, game one, everyone's Eastern Conference favorite in the garden. James Harden dropped 40 points, one game one, without Dwell Embiid. That's what James Harden can do. He dropped 40 again in that series with Embiid, and it created advantage in the uh, scoreboard in that series. And Of course, James Harden had a, game, had a bad game, five, six, and seven, which didn't help them win that series. But they aren't in that situation if James Harden in game one without a teammate, an MVP, and Joel Embiid doesn't drop 40. That's exactly what James Harden brings to the Clippers. And that's what I said that he brings. That's why the trade was worth it. Because you know Kawhi and Paul George, they that duo hasn't been together for half their game since the bubble in the playoffs. You have James Harden, you're more competitive. And that's exactly why the trade was worth it. And if the Clippers do end up winning the series, you're going to find out. Um, okay, I appreciate everyone for tuning into this episode of Some Casual Takes. Um, stay updated on all things related to the show. Follow my social media, Some Casual Takes is the handle. And until next time, see you.